Hey, Celeste, nice to see you. All right, well, we'll get started. Everyone, welcome. I'm uh, Michelle Sullivan. I'm the director of the Wyoming After School Alliance. And this is the second in our, uh, our Thursday roundtables on, on different topics related to entrepreneurship. And I wanna just, first of all, tell you a little bit about the Young uh, Entrepreneurs Initiative that the After School Alliance is a part of. Um, we're very lucky to be a part of a, a grant from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation that is allowing us to really try to develop the skills related to entrepreneurship in young people through after school and, and extended learning, whatever that looks like. And so if you haven't already, we would really encourage you to go to our website and register just so that you, as we have different opportunities and um, you're, you're, you're aware of them uh, and, and ask us questions, let us know how we can be of help to all of you as we're as we're really trying to develop these competencies in young people across our state. Uh, we really believe, and kind of one of our mottos is that uh, young people are our most important natural resource in Wyoming, and we wanna be able to really elevate their voices in a way that really reflects them to our communities as problem solvers and as uh, solution seekers for the challenges that we face as we go forward. Um, I'm really excited today to have uh, both Matt and Minden Fox, uh, both, and we did, we were like, hey, I wonder if they actually are related, you know, in Wyoming, you generally speaking, uh, could, could have that happen, but they were, they're both fabulous rock stars in their own right when, in, in, uh, at the university and at LCCC. And so I'd like to introduce first Matt and uh, uh, who, uh, who is assistant professor of entrepreneurship. Uh, Matt joined the University of Wyoming's College of Business in the Department of Management and Marketing. Uh, Matt, Matt, when did you join the university? Uh, two years ago. Two years ago, great. Well, we're delighted to have you. Uh, uh, Fox earned his PhD from Duke University and his MBA from the University of Nevada and his BA from Colorado College, which I have to say is my alma mater as well. So. Ah, go Tigers. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Same colors practically. Most recently he served as an assistant professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at the University of South Dakota Beacom School of Business and his research focuses on how entrepreneurs create new firms and technologies to make an impact. So welcome, we're delighted that you're, you can be with us today and uh, uh, this, we're, we're really, really proud of our partnerships with the university and with 4-H and uh, with the community colleges. So thank you for being here. Uh, and second, we'll, we'll hear from Minden Fox, who is a professor at, the, at LCCC and an entrepreneur in her own right. She joined LCCC as marketing and entrepreneur instructor in 2017. But in addition, uh, she is an internet and social media marketing enthusiast, food allergy blogger, and Navy vet. Um, and I just, uh, we just had a great kind of free ranging conversation and I would add uh, a creative maker to that list as well. Minden enjoys tackling complex programs and, and was known for this during her time in the military. She has a passion for marketing and her love of marketing was sparked watching her grandfather create ads for his store with an overhead projector and paint markers as a little girl. He loved attention to, he loved attention to detail, big creative displays, customer service and antique cars, and all of those traits he passed on to Minden. So we're delighted to have you as, as our entrepreneurial voice today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt and uh, I will uh, put myself on mute. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, I was asked to talk a little bit today about the role of solutions and being able to kind of formulate your solution uh, in the context of giving a pitch. Um, so, what I'd like to start with is just kind of an overview of the way that I think about entrepreneurship, which is uh, broader than the idea that you have to start a business, 
right? Starting a business is, is entrepreneurial, but there are lots of things that not just my students do, but that your students do that are incredibly entrepreneurial. One of the first activities I give my students in my class, I teach the intro to entrepreneurship, we call it Entrepreneurial Mindset, ENTR 2700 at the University of Wyoming. Uh, one of the first things we do is an exercise we call the uh, Marshmallow Challenge. The Marshmallow Challenge is I give my students uh, a pack of spaghetti. Uh, so they get 20 strands of spaghetti, they get a yard of twine, they get a yard of tape, scissors, and a marshmallow. And their job is to raise the marshmallow as high as they can, okay? And the idea here is that you have to be thinking about, you know, how do you, how do you create, how do you address, you know, in this case, what's a, a fairly trivial problem. But what I really like about this exercise is uh, there's a TED talk that goes along with it by Tom Wuyuk. And what he finds in his work is uh, that among the people who do best at the marshmallow challenge are kindergartners. And among the people who do worst are business students. And this is not to belittle business students. This is a natural outcome from the way that we tend to teach. Uh, so by the time students get to me, they have learned, among other things, that in school, somebody tells you what to do and you do that. And the closer you get to doing exactly what you were told, the better you're great. Uh, that's not conducive to entrepreneurship and it's not conducive as it turns out to building a marshmallow tower. Because what happens is uh, the students will spend a lot of time planning. Uh, the kindergartners start building right away. Business students start planning. They start thinking, okay, right? Like none of us are engineers. How do we build this thing? They spend about, you know, 12, 14 minutes out of 20 trying to figure out how do I build this thing? spend about three minutes building it. They put their marshmallow on top. They get these great structures. They put their marshmallow on top, falls over, okay? So most of the time, most of the groups have their marshmallow fall over. Uh, this happens in my class regularly. With kindergartners, they build smaller structures and they still fall over. But it took them three minutes to build the first structure that falls over what do they do? A little bit more spaghetti, a little bit more tape. Oh, okay. It stood up this time. We still got 10 minutes. Okay, well, let's build it bigger, right? And so they prototype and improve over time. Okay, they spend much less time planning and mostly they just dive into it. I do this at the beginning of every class as a way of introducing them to this idea that you cannot wait and plan and just kind of wait for inspiration to come to you and the perfect solution to appear. You're much better off just starting, okay? Uh, and so a lot of what I try and do in my class is get them out of the mindset of what school has always been for them, what's always been successful, and start thinking about the idea that in order to be entrepreneurial, you have to be doing something new, okay? And so when you're doing something new, this inherently carries the risk of failure, okay? So one of the things that I think is important to understand if you're teaching entrepreneurship to people who have never done this before is you need to create an environment in which it's safe to try new things and it's safe to fail at them, right? In fact, the more times your marshmallow tower falls over, the taller it will be, okay? The people who fail, the people who struggle the most with this, they only fail once, but they fail at the very end. So you, what I really try and do is focus more on process than on outcomes, okay? You're gonna come up with an idea uh, and it's going to solve a problem of some kind, right? I'm not, in, I, 
to some degree, we talk about starting businesses because it's kind of a way of implementation, but really it's just problem solving, right? What's the problem that you want to solve? And why is it a problem, right? And why is it a problem has kind of two parts to it. One part of why is it a problem is, well, what's wrong with that? Like, what do we, that's the way things are. Why, is this, why does this need a solution? The other part of the problem is, you know, what causes this, right? Well, why hasn't someone fixed it yet? If you can explain why it's important for someone to fix it, then why hasn't it happened, okay? And so another exercise I do in class is called the five whys. Uh, I don't, is anyone familiar with the five whys? Okay, so Minden is. Uh, but for those of you who aren't, this actually came out of the manufacturing process at Toyota. And what they found, what they did was when something would fail, you know, the, the first thing you do is you try and fix it, okay? But what happens is you end up treating the symptoms. And so the same thing keeps failing over and over again. And so what you need to do is get to the root of the problem. And so when something fails, you go through and you say, okay, well, why did that fail, right? And then you say, okay, well, why, why does that keep happening, right? And so you back it out five times. You answer why five times to really try to get to the root of this problem. Why does this keep happening? How do I solve it, okay? And in the course of doing that, you get a much richer answer in terms of what your solution to the problem is. Okay, so we're not treating the symptom. Uh, we're really saying, okay, this is where this problem comes from and this is how I'm going to solve it. Uh, and in a lot of cases, what you find is it's really important to solve each one of the five whys, right? You know, your, your fever is important. We need to get it down. Okay, fine, right? But why do you have a fever? Okay, and why, and why did that happen, right? So you have a fever because uh, you have the flu. Okay, well, why do you have the flu? Well, uh, you didn't get the flu vaccine for one. Okay, well, why didn't you get the flu vaccine? Well, lots of people don't get the flu vaccine. I don't know, no one I knew was getting the flu. Okay, well, why is that, right? Uh, because we know it works, right? So why, you know, why does this happen? Okay, so we still need to get your temperature down, but then there's this broader issue of how do we get more people to make healthy decisions, okay? And what we find is, oh, well, you know, there's lots of reasons why, okay? And for my class, I just ask my students to kind of pick one, right? When you're working in entrepreneurship, what you find is, you've actually got to do this many, many times to develop a coherent idea and a viable business, okay? But we don't necessarily need to get there in the one semester I have my students or whatever amount of time you have your students, right? You're, and, and it doesn't have, we don't have to cure cancer, right? It can be something as simple as, uh, I struggle to turn my homework in on time. Okay, well, why do you have, trouble turning your homework in on time. You know, one of the things that we find very quickly is, uh, number one, people who have trouble managing their time have different reasons why they're having trouble managing their time. So I have students who have trouble managing their time because they stay up till 2 a.m. playing Xbox. I have students who have trouble managing their time because they work full time, are starting a dance studio, have a child under the age of two at home and are taking 15 credits this semester, okay? That's a whole different problem, right? Everybody else needs to talk to you about how you manage your time. You need to learn to say no, <laughs> right? That's entirely different solutions for what seems like the same problem, but they're different problems, right? But I find it often is helpful if you start thinking about why is this a problem for you? You come up with a solution and you realize I'm not the only person who has this problem, right? There are lots of people who just don't manage time well and they stay up till 2 a.m.
playing Xbox and then they remember they've got a paper due at 8 a.m. and then they write it in the next six hours and they just click send before they even bother with spell check because it's time, right? So lots of people find solutions to that problem. If you can solve it for yourself, you can solve it for other people. If it's a big enough problem, someone should be willing to pay you to solve it, right? Learning how to kind of defend your time, so it's a different issue. But again, you're not the only one who has this problem. And if you can solve it for other people, if it's a big enough problem, someone should be willing to pay you to solve it, okay? And so this is where it starts to get into the business territory. But it's almost, when I teach it, especially for people who are just starting out, the business is almost an afterthought. It's really about What's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the solution you have for it? Uh, but then when people start talking about it, once they've gotten to the root, they've done their five whys, they've figured out, you know, what's, what's at the source of this? What am I really trying to solve? It becomes very easy and kind of exciting to be able to talk to other people and say, okay, well, here's a common problem. I experienced this problem. Lots of people experience this problem. And here's my solution to it. Okay, and, and once you've done that research of, you know, why is this problem, you do your five whys, you start thinking, you know, we work on brainstorming, right? So generate lots of ideas without judging, right? And then start picking through and seeing which are the good ones, right? You'll get more creative ideas if you don't judge them right away. You just generate lots of ideas, Okay, generate lots of ideas on your own, come together as a group, look at all of those ideas and start filtering through, what's the best idea? Can we combine ideas? How do we make these ideas better? Okay, and so, you know, we work through lots of different processes to really try and figure out, how do I come up with a good solution to this problem? Uh, and, and the students have a lot of fun with that, right? So one of the things I tell my students is, look, entrepreneurship, should be fun, okay? If, you, if this class isn't more fun than accounting, I'm doing something horribly wrong, right? Like, I know lots of accountants, they're wonderful people. Uh, they're very good at what they do and, and often they enjoy it, but they rarely describe it as fun, right? And so entrepreneurship should be fun. You should get to work on this stuff. It's kind of problem solving. It's almost like a puzzle right, you work your way through it, it is scary to them because they're used to the worst thing that can happen to you at school is you fail. And if you're trying new things, you fail a lot. And so, you know, it is scary to them. One of the things that I do that scares my students is I don't tell them exactly what to do. Uh, and again, they keep asking me for a rubric. What, you know, how are you going to award points on this? And it's like, no you need to think through, and you're perfectly capable of this, it's just that you haven't done it before. You need to think through, how do I convey the information I need my audience to have? Uh, so I just got done grading a bunch of projects that my students did working for a couple of startups at Impact 307, uh, helping them think through the early stages of their business and how they get these great scientific minds to think through, okay, well, like, but how do you, how would someone actually buy this, right? Like, how do I get my supplement on the shelf? How do I have this cool battery anode technology? How do I actually get it installed on a battery? Do I have to make the battery? Do I have to, can I make an anode and ship it to a battery maker? Can, can I just license it to them, right? What does that look like? And there's a lot of, pieces to this, right? And so the students are nervous about this, but once they realize, you know, these brilliant minds who came up with this technology don't have better answers to these questions than I can come up with if I spend time on it, right? It, it takes time. Uh, and there are, you know, the rabbit holes you go down that aren't productive, and that's okay. Right, but you start digging in, you come up with what solutions you can and the amount of time that you have, right? But really focus on the process of coming up with a wide range of possible solutions, right? 
whittling it down to what you think the best solution is. Start thinking about implementing that solution. What are the steps that would need to happen, right? And, you know, depending on the amount of time you have, you can kind of dig into that deeper or, or leave it a little more shallow. But ultimately, if we're talking about a pitch competition, fundamentally, you need, to, you need your audience to know, number one, this is an important problem that lots of people have. And number two, I have a solution to this problem. Okay, if, you're, if your pitch does nothing else, you need those two things. This is an important problem. And there are great stories around that, right? You wanna have good data, but you also wanna have that good narrative. Okay, tell that story about the person who struggled with this. Maybe it's you, maybe it's someone you know, but you know, tell the story. Okay, here's the problem. And what I found in trying to solve this problem is everybody thinks it's this, but it's really that, right? But I have a solution to this problem. And if you can answer those two things, uh, then you've, you're well on your way to a really strong pitch. Uh, so that's kind of how I would approach it with my students. Uh, what questions do you guys have? Or we're doing question and answer later. Maybe I should just let Minden, I'll, I'll defer the transition to a, a more official member of the group. <laughs> um, I guess if, if Joan or Melissa doesn't have anything to add, I, I'll go ahead with, with my half of this. Okay, yeah. or Michelle, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm supposed to talk about this more from the entrepreneur side, which I think is kind of funny because I don't always think of myself in that way. Um, but I use a lot of the same techniques that Matt has already talked about um, when I'm helping my own students, when I'm trying to develop my own ideas. Um, from my students, I pull in a lot of case studies um, to kind of stress, these are people that were more observant or more aware and recognized these huge opportunities in front of them, whether they became a business idea or just solved problems with the company they worked with. These were things that they did that made them more entrepreneurial. So I'm one of those nerds that likes to read about all these different examples and just finished a book all about um, maker spaces and companies that started out of maker spaces. And one of those that really stood out to me was this um, young man that was traveling all over the world and happened to be in this one country where he was watching children play soccer with a piece of trash. And so he asked them, why don't you have a soccer ball? And they said, we've had soccer balls before, but they always fall apart. And then so he thought, okay, I need to go home and I need to develop a soccer ball that's not going to fall apart with you know, long-term repeated use. And then I'm gonna make sure that the first of those soccer balls comes to kids in countries like this before I start selling it in the US or someplace like that. So he went back, um, I wanna say this was in California and immediately went to his makerspace and started playing around with different materials to um, test this and obviously different uh, prototypes to see what worked and what lasted longer and, and what didn't work until he came up with this final product. Um, or I can look to myself and think about, and I'm sure Matt probably experiences this too, but just uh, going to different meetings and people hear that you have a background in marketing and suddenly they want your advice to help them with their business or they want you to tell them, um, especially with my background in internet marketing, they say, how can I get my business on the top of Google searches? And I say, do you have a website? And they say no. And I said, well, that's the first thing. You can't be on the top of Google search without a website. And the more I kept having these conversations, I thought I've got to help some of these small businesses figure this out. And so that was kind of what launched my consulting business was all these conversations of small businesses wanting this, but not knowing how to get there. Um, and then I could go with one more big example that hasn't launched yet for me, but I'm hoping it eventually will. But it's had a lot of different um, pieces to it as we figured out what is going to work the best, what's going to actually solve this problem. So um, they mentioned earlier that I'm a food allergy blogger. So um, my family has been affected by food allergies for about 13 years now. And it's not just, you know, a peanut allergy or something like that. It's um, eggs, wheat, tomatoes shellfish, sesame seeds, nuts, peanuts, um, cocoa, 
Uh, the list seems to go on and on and gets longer and longer uh, every year as more sensitivities or more allergies are identified. And people just wondering how in the world do we live? Uh, what do we eat? <laughs> um, and just learning uh, kind of as we went along. Um, and that was kind of what started the blog. But then as we attempted to do more and more things with all these food allergies, as we've tried to travel um, and go to football games and concerts and baseball games and just try to live what feels like a normal life, we're still running into issues like there's no safe food anywhere in these places or we sneak food into these places to make sure that we have something and came up with this thought of why aren't these places catering to the growing number of people with not just food allergies, but what about people with celiac disease or lactose intolerance or some of these other conditions that make it really difficult for them to go really anywhere where there's food involved. And so we started playing around with ideas like, could you solve this problem with a food truck? Could you solve it with like community gatherings before these events? And we thought, well, yes, those are both ideas that would help. But the bigger concern was getting safe snacks or safe foods into these actual places. Um, so we thought, well, what if we just got them um, into like the food stands at the football game or something like that? And thought, well, that doesn't necessarily work unless you have very specific rules on how you then handle that product. Because something as small as handling a hot dog bun and then handling that safe food, even though it's wrapped up, that little bit of wheat dust on that package is now enough to make that person sick. So we thought, okay, we've got to really think about um, limiting contact and cross-contamination if we were to put the product actually inside like a football stadium or a music, music venue or something like that. So we thought, what about vending machines? Um, and then took that a step further and thought, well, how do we make the vending machine stand out from the Pepsis and the Cokes and the Lay's potato chips and everything else? Um, and teal blue is the color of food allergy awareness. So we thought, what if we just did a big teal blue box? You probably couldn't miss a teal blue vending machine. That would stand out probably. And it guarantees that the food is safe and the food's actually there where you need it. Um, so we came up with what we're calling blue box fox for a big blue vending machine box put out there by the Fox family. So we'll hopefully get this idea launched in the next year, but we tried to launch in 2020 when no one's out and about at football games or music venues or anything like that. But um, so then using some of these experiences and stories with my students um, and talking about how I didn't just pull a random idea. I really pulled from an area that I'm passionate about, I'm very interested in and very involved in, um, and kind of looked at what are the issues there? What are um, the things in those areas that I wish someone would solve? Um, and basically went from there. Another one that we are still trying to figure out because I know TSA hates us, but we, when we fly, when we travel, we actually travel with a grill with a portable grill. And then when we get to where we're going, we'll go to a Walmart or wherever, and we'll get one of those little canisters of propane. And that's how we make sure that when we travel, we have safe food to eat. And TSA hates us when we travel, but they've never taken our grill. They just always stick a little slip of paper in there that tells us they's, they've messed with our luggage. But, so that's another one we're trying to figure out. Like, how do we, how do we make it easier to travel? Because not every hotel is very cooperative when we tell them we absolutely have to have a fridge and a microwave in our room. Um, so yeah, just, just little things um, as someone that's affected by food allergies. And I think I've probably hit my 15 minutes now too, haven't I? So I'll stop and, and <laughs> leave it open to some questions now. Thanks to both of you, and I, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Joan to kind of uh, coordinate questions, but that was fantastic. Thanks to both of you. Questions to, to, to our speakers? Sarah. Sarah, yeah, Sarah, go ahead. I just, I, that's so interesting, Minden. You're, I'm really, um, I have some of the same food allergies. They don't manifest themselves. They're, I've been tested, they're called food intolerances, but um, I'm really uh, susceptible to fragrance. P 
people with fragrances really can get me. Um, I think it's probably asthma, but um, these boxes, these teal blue boxes, who are you, are they, what are they going to look like? <laughs> I mean, um, what, yeah. what, structurally, I, I'm just kind of trying to. Um, if I could share my screen, I'd show you our logo, but it's literally a box with fox ears and a tail. And so we're <laughs> going to make the, um, the blue on these boxes very geometric and pull from the triangles we're using for the ears and the tail and square shapes and, um, and then make sure we've got that big logo on it too. And even thinking about, well, maybe you have a hanging sign over it in some locations so that you can see it, especially in a big crowded auditorium or like the arena, right? You can see that from a distance, but then also having um, some kind of feature either on our website or on an app that says, okay, this is where machines are located, not just right. like, saying, okay, there's one in, you know, at UW in the arena auditorium, it's specific and says, well, it's outside this specific gate um, to make it easier for people to find. Right, or it like DIA, you know, which- Exactly, like concourse, whatever. Which concourse, which, yeah, 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 neat. Yeah. And they're, these are like, they'll, they're sort of vending, they are vending machines, like your classic sort of yep, they're going vending to machine machines. mechanism. But we're looking at, you know, because you, you know this, um, with food allergies, you have to look at every single little ingredient. Um, so because these are going to be behind glass at a vending machine, you have to have some way to still know what's in that product. So we thought, well, let's use QR codes. So a QR code next to every product in the vending machine so that you can use your phone to then take you to a page on the site that says, here's everything about this product that you want to know. Here's the ingredient list. Here's how it's manufactured. Is it manufactured in a safe facility or not? So that you can make that decision on, is this product safe for me to eat or not? Right, right, yeah, neat. So yeah, again, it's still a lot of trial and error and even, okay, we've got an idea that let's put them in a vending machine, but even that wasn't enough too. We had to even take that a step further. Yeah, yeah. Michelle, did you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, so one of the things I know that we're hearing from a lot of programs, after school programs and, and youth serving programs is kind of how to get sort of transition from what Matt, you were talking about as uh, that, you know, fear of failure, how you, how you really kind of shift kid, young people's minds to get more into that uh, kind of fifth or fifth kindergarten mindset over time. And I'm curious if, if you could talk a little bit, either one of you about the kind of strategies that you have to really help get young people a little more comfortable with that failure or failing forward, if you will. Yeah, so uh, a couple of things. What is just basic expectation setting? Okay, uh, so just, and, and I have learned over time, you need to repeat this over and over again, right? I don't expect your ideas to be perfect. I expect you to make progress over the time that we work on them, right? Uh, and, you know, here are, here are the things that I do expect and here are things, look, I, my students aren't going to launch a business based on the best idea they had within the first three weeks of class that they subsequently worked on for another three weeks, right? Like that's not a business. <laughs> okay. That's fine. That's fine. We don't need to get there. Okay. But we do need you to start thinking about, you know, what are you really good at? Right? What do you care about? What's important to you? Okay, how can we apply your skills and passion in a way that solves a problem that would be meaningful to you? Right? One of the things that I warn my students against is I'm very, very skeptical of chasing trends. Uh, and I use a book that tells people to look for trends. And I tell them, no, <laughs> don't do that. Like, I, I know the book says this, and there's value in knowing what the trends are, but it's not the right way to figure out what do you want to work on. You need to focus first on what are you good at? What do you care about, right? 
And how can you use that in a way that would solve a problem? Because otherwise, you know, one of the trends in the book is like nanotechnology, right? I have university students, but they're business students. They shouldn't, nanotechnology is not the right field for them. They've already made that choice, right? Uh, now, I might occasionally have an engineer. I might have a business student who's really broad. One of my absolute best students this semester was pre-med and had some great ideas that no one else in the class would have had, right? But, but it starts with you. It's not what's out there, right? It, it starts with you. And so one of the things I do is encourage that. I do an exercise that's called the reflected best self, where you ask the people who know you best about the times they've seen you at your best, mm -hmm. right? When you've been your most alive. Uh, and so, you know, th this is true for my students who are older than your students, but uh, a whole lot younger than anyone else on the call. You know, th they don't know, they, they feel like they're supposed to know their calling, right? But they overwhelmingly don't. I have ex there are exceptions to that in my class, but there are exceptions, mostly, 19 and 20 year old kids don't know what they want to do with their life, right? They might have a plan. They might be like, well, I'm going to major in accounting, but you know, but, but that's basically to get them through the next three years, right? Like that'll get them through graduation. And if, and hopefully in their minds, their first job, right? But you know, as a calling, you know, that's not, they don't, they don't know that yet. They don't feel that yet. And also a lot of times, you know, you get musicians and what do people say? What are you going to do with that? Right. I'm going to start a business, <laughs> you know, like I'm going to work for myself. How do you take what you love and do it as a job? and not let anyone tell you how you have to do it. Like this is the beautiful thing about entrepreneurship is you get to do what you wanna do, okay? Now it's gonna be hard and frankly, most businesses fail, okay? That's, that's the reality. But you know what, you get to start again. You, you can start a different business or you can go work for somebody else, right? Just because the business isn't around anymore doesn't mean that it wasn't a valuable experience. You know, one of the nice things about doing this while you're in school, and that's, this is as true for your students as it is for mine, is if it doesn't go well, that's okay, right? Like, keep going to class. It's fine. You know, if you've got a great idea for a business and it, something happens, you know, last semester, last spring, I had a student with a business that he started in class and it was thriving and COVID hit and it was dead in days, right? You know, that wasn't a bad idea, right? He didn't do anything wrong. That stuff happens, right? Often it happens in less dramatic ways than that, okay? So the other thing that I do is just aggressive positivity. All of your ideas are great ideas, but they all need work, right? They're not there yet. That's fine. Do the work, right? Are you going to launch a business in the next three weeks? Probably not, right? It, if you're going to go for it, go for it. I'm not going to stop you, but that's not my expectation, okay? And so once they realize, okay, well, these expectations make sense, uh, and I can try something and I'm just going to take it as far as I can in the time that we have. Right. And my goal for our students when they graduate and they have to take more classes after mine, but my goal for our students when they graduate is not that they start a business is that they feel no, that they know how to make the choice. Right. My goal is when you graduate, whatever your idea for a business is at that point, you feel like you know the answer to, should I start this business now? Should this be what I do instead of taking that job, you know, working for that hotel, right? Or whatever that other thing is, you know, just feel like you know the answer to that question. Is, is this what I wanna do right now? Thank you. So that's my approach.
Yeah. And then I, I would add to that, like we, we expect students to pivot um, and you don't want to ever crush any ideas, but do we really need more photographers? <laughs> um, or if you are dead set on being a photographer, what are you specifically going to do that sets you apart from every other photographer in town that you're competing against? Um, with case studies, because I mentioned that earlier, um, I actually use a lot of case studies where that entrepreneur that suddenly has success has failed before. Um, you look at like uh, the guy with Dollar Shave Club. That was easily, um, I want to say his seventh or eighth. There's actually a book out there where his parents actually talk about they had a corner of their house that was all his failed business ideas, all the stuff that was left over from those ideas that didn't succeed. Um, but he eventually found the right idea. He was the, had the right mindset, um, was just kind of destined to be a successful entrepreneur. He just had to find the idea that made the most sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just really encourage these kids that even if it's not this idea, you at least know this process now. And when you feel like you do have the right idea, you can go through this same process and say, yeah, everything seems to be clicking. The market's there. Um, I feel like I can compete against the competition. People are willing to pay the price that I know I need to charge um, and some of those things. So, Yeah, so I use this quote in my class from Thomas Edison where he says, I've never failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work, right? Every, every bad option you rule out was time well spent. Okay, uh, and my students actually struggle with this more on their consulting projects than on their own ideas. You know, their own ideas, they, they're terrified enough going into it that when they figure out it's not going to work, that it doesn't necessarily crush them. Uh, but when they're working for a client who is trying to start a business, and, and these are kind of real businesses, but they're really early, right? So like, these are typically companies that have never had a sale. Okay, but they're trying to get started. They're active. They're at Impact 307. They've got this cool technology. Uh, and the students need to say, I don't have the right answer for you, but what you are doing now is not going to work. Mm. Right? Uh, that's pretty intimidating for them. And so the way I handle that is to say, listen, number one, that is hugely valuable for this person to know. Okay? Number two, this is not about your conclusions. This is about your evidence. If you present your evidence in the right way, by the time you're done talking about what the evidence is, they will have come to the same conclusion you did. And when you say it out loud, they know it's coming. Okay? So you need to gather enough evidence. If you're going to say, don't do this, right? It's you don't just crap on their dreams, right? But present the evidence. You've done this work. Tell them what the evidence says, right? And then, you know, there might be a gentle way to put it, right? So I had students who were working on these supplement companies. Uh, There's a couple different ones that they were working on. They wanted to try and sell it through doctors. Uh, so my students went out and talked to some doctors. Uh, and the doctors said, I'm not... Rec nobody, I don't recommend supplements. I like, I recommend drugs that have been through the FDA process. <laughs> like that's how I know that it works. I, I don't know that these things work. Mm. Um, but at the same time, a lot of what the students found didn't slam the door shut. It just said, this is going to be hard, right? So what are the objections? One of the things they found is that actually lots of doctors use supplements, but they won't recommend them. Well, that's interesting, right? One of the reasons doctors give for not recommending weight loss supplements is the drugs that went through the approval process and caused people serious harm, right? Like doctors used to prescribe Fenfen. Doctors used to prescribe amphetamines for weight loss. Amphetamines actually work for weight loss, by the way, but we don't prescribe them anymore, okay? So this stuff went through the process, okay? So, you know, what my students did, and I thought this was really just a, a great example of a pivot that worked really well, is they said, one of the common complaints from doctors is, my patients want a pill instead of just eat right and exercise. And I don't want to give them that. 
And so what my students suggested instead was start with trainers. Start with personal trainers and people who work at gyms and see if they'd be willing to recommend it because number one, they're more open to it, right? Number two, people still trust their expertise. If you've got a personal trainer that recommends a supplement, that might not mean as much as if a doctor did it, but it still means a lot, actually, right? And if you can generate that level of interaction and goodwill, when you say to doctors, all right, well, you know, we haven't been through the FDA process, but we do have some scientific articles. That helps. Uh, also, we, we understand that you're concerned that people use this as a substitute for diet and exercise. We believe it works best as a complement to diet and exercise. And we will actually mostly work with trainers, okay? And so here's some trainers you could talk to about their success using our product, right? So we're not saying don't go to doctors. We're saying don't go to doctors yet, okay? And so, you know, that's one of those ways where you can think through, okay, well, you know, and, and ultimately, that's a hugely valuable skill. As an entrepreneur, you're going to hear no a lot, okay? Learn to treat it as a not yet, right? Treat it as a not yet. It's not ready yet. Joan? Thank you, Matt. That, that's awesome. And I, I wanted to be sure we, we have a question in the chat, if you don't mind, if we kind of transition into that. Yeah. Um, uh, Bailey's asking, and this, we might not be able to cover all of this today, but it, it's a good question. Um, either Minden or Matt jump in. What are your thoughts on accessibility of being an entrepreneur without, say, a silver spoon or a huge financial backing, so to speak? And, and how does one do that without risking so much, especially um, for older entrepreneurs or more mature that might be risking health insurance or those types of things? Um, do you have thoughts on, on that that you could share with the group? Um, I'll, I'll start on that one if Matt doesn't mind. Um, so I guess I look at that, this from two different sides. I really look at the students and, and almost kind of pick on them in class when I see, you know, how many of you have a Starbucks cup in front of you or a Mountain Dew or whatever? How many of you are willing to sacrifice that expense and start setting that money aside so that you can actually achieve this dream? How many of you are actually applying to the competitions and the grants and some of those kinds of things? And I can specifically call them out and say, I know for a fact we only had 10 people apply to solo this year. So you can't sit here and tell me that uh, you're struggling to find funds to help you when you didn't even apply to um, a contest like that, that literally would have given you not only money, but connected you with key people that could have helped you answer some of these questions like, you know, how do I afford health insurance if I walk away from my job full time? Um, what do I need, um, you know, law wise or to protect myself insurance wise? Um, I, I share with my students that I teach extra classes every single semester and in the summer and I put all that money aside to help with the launch for Blue Box Fox. Um, my consulting business, all of that money also goes into the fund to start Blue Box Fox because the fancy vending machines that I want to use, they are not cheap. Um, so so I, I, I have a somewhat different approach, um, which is uh, kind of more, more, more academic, right? So here's, here's what I know, right? Number one, uh, having family who are willing to invest in your business is a great cheap way to get people to invest with you. Uh, I, I can't deny that, right? That's, a, that's an advantage some people have and you may not. But if you look at the rates of entrepreneurship among recent immigrants, people who came here with nothing, their rates of entrepreneurship are unusually high, right? Now, these people aren't starting nanotechnology firms for the most part, right? Like they're starting little bodegas, but you know what? They're in charge. Actually, entrepreneurship can be your way around some of those walls that get put up because if you can meet a need and get someone to pay you, then no one can tell you you can't, right? You, 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 you 
can kind of work around the discrimination that way, whether it's, you know, economic or racial or gender based, right? Uh, yes, it will be harder for you. It, it may be harder for you to get money, but ultimately the key is you need to really create value. If you can really create value, you know, it may not be an easy road, okay? But you can still work around that. Now I just got a final from a kid whose idea for starting a business was he was going to get his pilot's license and join his parents' business. And I was like, that's, no, <laughs> like that, that was not, that, that's not starting a business. Like I was, I was asking a different question. That sounds exciting and fun and, and like, you know, there, there is a realm in which you are creating value with that, but you, you didn't answer the question very well. Right. Uh, and so I get, I do get the students who have that huge leg up. Uh, but I also get students who clearly did not. And, if, and the idea is if you know how to create value and you can communicate that, the opportunities will be there for you, right? And in fact, it might be better as an entrepreneur than it would be working for somebody else. Thank you. Thank I, you, I had my mic off. Go ahead, Michelle. No, I was gonna say, go ahead. And I, I'll let you close it out, Joan, and appreciate, appreciate everybody so much. Um, we're looking forward to continuing to learn together and, and look forward to just to, to keep the questions coming as we go and we'll try to keep them getting answered. Well, yeah. right, and thank you everybody. And I think Matt and Minden have both mentioned this at different times that especially as we're working with our youth through this process of developing a pitch, it's really an opportunity to practice um, using skills that are associated with the entrepreneurial mindset without the end result having to be that they start a business, but more be, being able to practice their creativity, to practice failing in a safe environment, learning things about themselves, building their network, which may eventually lead to them starting a business or launching a product or service to sell or finding a, a problem to solve that you can be paid for. Um, but really it can encompass a much more broad set of experiences. Would you both agree with that? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Well, we're almost to the end of our time. Michelle, do you, should we take one more question or? Uh, it, is there, I will, yeah, defer to every, everybody if there's a, there is a question for sure. I think I saw one up here. Sarah mentioned that um, she had her brother, who oddly enough is an entrepreneur, say the other day um, that his advice is sometimes to college kids don't follow your dream but find something that interests you and that can make a living so how might students wrap this um, pragmatic approach into entrepreneurship uh, so my, my feeling is why not do both right uh, I mean so one of the reasons why I start my class with what are you good at and what are you passionate about is uh it's going to be hard without either one of those right and so uh, that's partly he mentions right something that interests you right but the fact is it's going to require so much time that if you don't like it right you're just you won't be able to put in the amount of time it will take to do it well uh but i do also have students whose business ideas are just like, I really like doing this. And they sometimes struggle to get past, uh, I'm going to start a business doing exactly what I want to do to the point of it has to create value for someone else to the point that they would pay you for it. Right? Like that, that can be hard for them. Uh, and so uh, this is another one of those areas where I just think repetition and setting expectations is important. So Tell them again and again, it is not enough that you want to do this. It has to create value for someone else to the point that they would pay you for it. That's my great. Approach. Thank you. Thank you. Great thoughts. Great thoughts. I'll offer again. Again, I'm Joan Evans. I am working with the Alliance as a project manager specifically on the, 
the pitch challenge and the entrepreneurial activity. So don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us at any time via Kate or Michelle and myself. We have Heather Heath also on our team from Impact 307 who wasn't able to join us today. And we want to you know, walk side by side with you as you work with your students in your programs. And hopefully you've been able to utilize some of our resources on the Wyoming After School website under the Pitch Challenge resources. So don't hesitate to reach out to us at any time. Michelle, any final thoughts? No, just thank you so much. Sorry, I'm getting a little sunshine late in the day here. Um, we're just delighted to have you with us and, and uh, keep us posted on how things are going and how we can be of support to you. Thanks to our speakers. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Mendon. Nice to meet you all.